Hey, welcome back to Streamline Entertainment. Um, we're going to get into a video about the truth about Ronica's strict Tenerife in less Americas. And this YouTuber, as uh, Capri, um, has gone through parts of um, Las Americas and Los Cristianos in Tenerife. And then he meets a American guy who talks to him about what goes down. It's quite interesting. So I'm going to play it from here. Um, This is someone he's met who seems to know, you know, the actual cue in what actually goes on in uh, Los Cristianos. I always think if you've got money and uh, you, you've got a sense of trouble coming your way and you're staying out of it, I think you can have a great time. We're not, like I said, these channels are not running Tenerife down, but I think it's just to keep your eyes open. Because it look, you can hear the American guy here, yeah, he's travelled the world and likes to travel and he says he's had some fantastic times in Tenerife. So it just proves if you, you know, you keep out of trouble. You can have a wonderful time, but like I said, I think some people run out of money and <coughs> want to do something extra to stay out there. <laughs> I think this YouTuber, what he tends to do is just go around uh, some of the uh, Veronica strips uh, wherever and just talks to random people. But some of it can be late at night where people are quite peed up. Where are you? What do you mean down the wheel? Send me a location. Send me a location. 
New seat, sadly, you're on location, yeah? Okay, I made it back home. It's been a eventful night. Yeah, so that was um, Ads Capri. If you want to follow him, he does meet some interesting people, but it's good to have knowledge of someone who uh, basically has got a place out there, like the American guy um, that he met, and I'm sure he gave um, Ads Capri, the YouTuber, um, a few pointers into what it looks out for. Um, like I said, you can have a good time, but you have to have your wits um, about you. If you're thinking of going out there, I came across the Knight Rider and he's um, quite well known on YouTube and he's got a place in Tenerife. Um, so uh, he said there's a lot of problems in Los Cristianos. Listen to what he had to say and this wasn't that long ago. Oh, my previous video. Warning, uh, just last week, I did talk about all of the muggings that were going on in this area, something that a lot of people don't want to talk about. It's not really being reported in the news. Not many people want to discuss it. However, I'm happy to warn you about it because I do think, personally, it's better to warn you than not warn you. Um, that situation did continue after I filmed that video. There was two more muggings after that and also another one last night. So with regards to this area here, do be very careful. That's Paradise Park, Beverly Hills Club, Beverly Hills Heights. Royal Palm, Port Royal, uh, Dynastia, Castle Harbour, Club Tenerife, any of the hotels, Castle Harbour as well, any of these hotels around here do be very, very careful because it has continued to go on. There was another one last night, which I'm just going to quickly read to you, that was posted in the Los Cristianos group, so do be very careful. Uh, just a heads up, I heard a woman talking with her daughter um, last night and she'd been mugged just outside Dynastia, uh, they jumped out of a car, stole their bag. What I noticed is, is some of these areas, they're quite nice areas, and I think you've got a lot of opportunities, thieves um, outside or hanging about, loitering about these hotels, looking for victims or women they can steal bags off. That's terrible. Uh, and just be very careful. So there you go, it's still continuing to go on. No leaflets, no warnings, no extra police. Uh, around, no extra patrols, no undercover stings, still absolutely nothing. And that's got to be six or seven cases in the same area now, happening the same sort of time, similar sort of pattern, but nothing gets done. So I want to give you an update on that. A lot of people are saying, oh, well, if they sorted it, yes, if they call who's doing it, uh, can you give a description of who's doing it? These are obviously organised gangs who are doing it, um, pinpointing people, um, realising they're quite new in the area or newbies and just um, um, getting what they can. But it could be fateful. What if you started fighting them back or something and someone pulls a knife and, you know, the next minute it could be fateful. Fate fatal. So you've got to be careful what situations um, and be vigilant in what's around you, especially around that area. In terms of description, I've heard a few different stories. There are different nationalities. Um, a lot of what people say is they are European, however, how you would know that I'm not too sure, but from what people have seen and heard from actually being mugged by them, uh, they are European, but people will come in, in the comments with all kinds of different accusations towards all kinds of different nationalities, either way it shouldn't be happening, what is more worrying is that the police are doing absolutely nothing in my opinion to solve it, to do anything, why not put up a few it's the same area every time, why not warn the people that are here and put up a few little leaflets around, a few flyers on a few, um, you know, a few of the fences just to warn people that muggins are happening in this area. So it is all just to warn you again, Los Cristianos seems to be the place that it's happening this year. It was a little bit more Las Americas last year. This winter certainly seems to be Los Cristianos. It is where a lot more of the older generation stay, where you've got the apartments, you've got uh, all kinds of different accommodation here. So. It does seem to be the place that they're targeting. I think you've just got to be ever so careful. And like you said, it seems like they're um, uh, these sort of organised gangs uh, who are stealing, they're exploiting older people or people they think they've got money that stays in these, these top hotels. Um, so just be careful. Um, that's some good information there, I think. 
We're moving on uh, back to a mystery, going back to Kevin Ainsley's Night Out uh, in Tenor Reef. Very, very interesting story. So let's just get straight into this. Um, bit creepy too. Kevin Ainsley's disappearance in June 2004 after a night out in Playa de las Americas adds another layer to Tenerife's mystifying narrative. Kevin Ainley Age 24, I had moved to the island just months before my disappearance, working as a promoter at the Sportsman Bar. His last confirmed sighting was a mundane one. He was seen walking towards the bar after dining at Merlin's Chinese Buffet Restaurant. His apartment was later found untouched, with his belongings and passport intact, suggesting a... That really, obviously, reminds me of a little bit of the case with Jay Slater. A lot of his stuff was in his apartment. His mum picked up um, his passport and the stuff he left there. Sudden and unplanned departure. Subsequent investigations revealed potential witnesses who hinted at an altercation involving Kevin outside the Café Del Mor. The involvement of Lancashire Police in 2005, though well-intentioned, did little to unravel the circumstances of his disappearance. His case, like others, stirs a deeper inquiry into the safety and security of those who choose Tenerife as their home or holiday destination. The heart-wrenching story of Peter Wilson, who vanished in March 2019, underscores the profound impact of each unexplained disappearance on the families involved. Peter. It, a lot of it sounds like, to me, um, uh, cover-ups or like I said, mafia related, but to not know and for the families to not have leads. And I think sometimes the police know what's going on, but don't really um, let it out to the public um, because so many people go there and they want to redeem it It's safe. Look in the last video, all the crime going on and you would have thought the police there be vigilant or putting signs up. So, uh, but nothing. Tells you everything. Wilson. My journey to Tenerife was meant to be a short holiday, but it ended in a tragedy that remained unsolved for nearly two years. His last known whereabouts were near where a taxi dropped him off after a night out, a starting point that led to an agonizing search by his distraught family. Wow. Despite extensive efforts by his family, including the creation of a dedicated Facebook group and multiple trips to Tenerife, Peter remained missing until his body was discovered near a shopping mall. This grim find was made even more tragic by the circumstances of his death. He had apparently fallen down a steep drop, a cruel twist of fate that went unnoticed for too long. The impact on Peter's family was profound, with his mother expressing a mix of devastation and relief upon finally being able to bring him home. The disappearance of Ricky De Carter plunged his family into a relentless cycle of hope and despair, a psychological torment that many families of missing persons endure. Ricky De Carter, living with the ambiguity of not knowing a loved one's fate, leads to a unique form of grief, often referred to as ambiguous loss. This type of loss is particularly excruciating as it offers no closure or opportunity to mourn. I think that's what it is. It, it's uh, when you when someone's missing, it's that fear. You don't know what happened to them. The overthinking, the anxiety that kicks in. It must be absolutely awful. And it must have been for Jay's mum and dad as well. The toll on Ricky's family can be seen through their sustained efforts in searching for him, clinging to every potential sighting and piece of information as a possible lead. 
Family dynamics can also become strained as each member copes differently with the loss, sometimes leading to conflicts and isolation within the unit. The psychological concept of frozen grief is relevant here as the family's mourning process is stalled, unable to reach any conclusion. The story of Ricky Dakota's family is a poignant reminder of the unseen battles that families of missing persons fight daily. One prevalent theory is that Ricky's involvement in the local nightclub scene, known for its vibrant yet sometimes volatile nature, may have led to unsavoury interactions with the wrong individuals. Another speculation involves the possibility of Ricky wanting to start anew, perhaps overwhelmed by the pressures and lifestyle associated with his job in a bustling nightclub. The involvement of local criminal elements has also been floated, particularly given the risky nature of the nightclub industry in tourist-heavy areas where illicit activities can sometimes flourish. It sounds like to me that if people want to get involved, anyone who wants to get involved with narcotics, it's very easy to do over there. But I don't think people know the dangers if things go wrong or you owe this mafia money or things go missing. Like there's so many recent cases and of all that I've mentioned uh, one already, a big one. It tends to be uh, the same consequence if, if things go wrong, uh, which is quite odd because I came across this channel and I didn't even know these people had, 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 had gone missing. So it's quite incredible that sometimes the Tenerife police are not really showing the magnitude of what's really going on there, especially when bodies are not found. Theory opens up avenues for investigation, but also deepens the mystery, as concrete evidence remains elusive. The mysterious disappearance of Ricky Dakota devastated his family and sent ripples of fear through Tenerife. Such incidents alter the perception of safety, mm -hmm. affecting the social. One hundred percent, I agree. Fabric. Increased anxiety and suspicion arise impacting community cohesion and trust. Residents become more suspicious of newcomers, overly cautious in interactions. This leads to social withdrawal, straining community ties. The collective psyche transforms, affecting local businesses and tourism. Tourists are deterred by unsolved mysteries, leading to economic downturn. This exacerbates community anxiety. This is why I think uh, they are so dependent uh, on people coming in and uh, Tenerife and Los Cristianos and you know the, where the other revelers go that it's kept in good spirit and people go away happy but it doesn't always work like that. A testament to the effects of unresolved mysteries. Resolving cases is crucial for families and restoring communal security. The community's resilience is tested, dependent on restoring trust and safety. Media, especially documentaries and news, shape public perceptions about Ricky Dakota's disappearance. The Channel 4 documentary Looking for Ricky brought significant attention to his case. Media coverage serves as both advocacy and sensationalism. Documentaries and news keep cases like Ricky's in the public eye. This media involvement can reignite stalled investigations. Sensational coverage can distort facts, complicating investigations. Media portrayal of Tenerife as mysterious affects its tourism. Awareness can... We know that uh, technically it's a chain reaction uh, from a crime being committed there to the police getting involved. They can't find this missing person. 
one day goes by, two days go by and three days go by. And I think people have got fed up of so many people going missing. And it actually comes into world news. And that's why there was big speculation on what happened to Jay Slater and why wasn't he found and they think it was a cover up. Um, they are certainly, certainly uh, a lot of secrets, I think, in those um, mountains as well. I really do think that. And our fairly latest picture of the island. Balancing responsible journalism and sensationalism is crucial. Media's role in cases like Ricky's can mobilise public opinion. Ethical journalism is imperative in these sensitive stories. This ordinary evening took a mysterious turn when Kevin vanished without a trace. His untouched belongings add layers of complexity, leaving room for endless speculation. Investigative effort. Endless speculation is because people aren't getting the answers they want. How can someone just disappear into absolutely thin air? Um, there has to be answers for this. And some of these cases, uh, which um, this guy's been talking about, have gone back to 2004 and further back than that. I was quite surprised. I've come across now maybe 30 or 40 cases um, which are not as recognised as the, the, obviously, the Jay Slater case, but are out there. It's incredible. ...that's faced numerous challenges, including the transient nature of Tenerife's tourists. These obstacles highlight the difficulties in tracking down leads. This fluid demographic hampered the police investigation. The impact resonates beyond the immediate circle of the missing person. It stirs fears about safety and security in what is supposed to be a paradise for the family it is but like i said people get themselves into things that they can get themselves out of and especially if concerning man just looking for some more information on that ricky went missing in 1987 and um people have left some uh messages on a tenor forum uh, this is on the 3rd of 4th, 2015 at 5 past 3. To anyone who's been on the island for decades, I'm interested in the 1987 disappearance of Ricky uh, Dakota. Some say he's still alive. Some say he was bumped off by, by some so-called drug lord shortly after 28 years. Any villain from the era is either retired, dead or in prison. And it must be okay to talk about what now if there's any merit in the story others than anyone who remembers the sergeant peppers era uh, that where he worked cheers looking for ricky is an investigation into his disappearance of ricky De uh, dakota a london boy who left east london for the tenerife 80s club scene and never returned it begins the interview of people who knew Ricky as a boy and then moves out to the island to try and trace Ricky's last moves in Tenerife. The story develops into exposed the island's drug fueled criminal underworld, who I think have been there for many, many years. It was everyone from the editor of the local papers uh, to the police seemed somehow implicated in the course of the film. It's discovered that five unidentified bodies exist, which may, which may be Ricky's remains. Although DNA tests using samples from Ricky's family's proof inconclusive, the final statement from Ricky's best friend reveals that Ricky was almost certainly murdered from a botched robbery of local drugs baron. Wow. Someone else went on to say this on the 3rd of the 4th, 2015. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm aware of the Simon Egan documentary after scene in which he was uh, broadcast circular 2001. Uh, given what this site is. I was kind of wondering whether anyone either remembers the incident or was just around the strip at the time. Thanks anyway. So a lot of people uh, are still looking into uh, what actually um, happened to him. The funny thing is, I'm just going to... Uh, it's, it's what I gather about these cases happening in the Tenerife. It's the same sort of scenario. They go missing or they're found months or years later and then because it's been so long it actually just gets faded out they've got into some trouble um, the drug dealers the police are not talking about it so this tells me it's gone on for many 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 years 
We're just going to move on to the final part uh, of what I'm actually talking about in some of the reasons why people stay quiet in Tenerife. Interesting. So this was um, some of the documentary. If anyone wants to, it's very, very interesting. Uh, David T. Malorca looking for Ricky and it actually, um, Channel 4 were actually talking to a bar owner, Bob, in 2001 about uh, what goes on on the island. It's very, very interesting. And it gives you some insight in what people are thinking when someone goes missing and why sometimes they don't speak. Twenty four hours a day. <coughs> they do the least sort of things, a lot of them are impressionable, they've never been away from home before. They get easily led by manipulative people who can I mean you can answer basically I'm trying to do year around Veronica's and that type of area. Um, and they can they can get themselves into all kinds of trouble. Who runs that area? Who runs that Veronica? <laughs> People are friendly enough. As he smiled. But it's obvious there are things they just don't talk about. Can you understand why people don't say anything in front of the camera? Can you understand why people won't say things to me in front of the camera? Right. I mean, it all depends on what questions you're asking them anyway, don't it? I mean, you, I mean you got, if you're going to ask me some questions uh, and I think, no, I'm going to jeopardise myself, obviously I'm not going to ask you, you know, uh, in any way. So, it's, uh, yeah, I can, I can understand people not, not, you know, uh, not saying anything at all, you know. Uh, Veronica's, the seedy strip at the centre of the resort, is a half mile stretch of bars, clubs and fast food joints. I think a lot of people, like I said, <coughs> really enjoy themselves there, but I think when people want to stay there, sometimes they can get involved or they're running out of money, they can get involved in things they shouldn't, uh, which could lead to their demise. But I understand, it seems like to me, even all the way back then to the 80s, there's an, um, a written rule, people are not allowed to talk. And in the Jay Slater case, it was exactly, um, the club owners don't really talk, the bar staff, um, the people from England, the young people who go out there, and the team leaders are working bars, they're not allowed to say nothing or they lose their job. And it seems a written rule where people know not to talk. This is why I think so many things are actually covered up in Tenerife. So I thought that was interesting, but they, I, I'm gonna do a part two tomorrow on this.